listening to the AT Tapes, a podcast from the Journal of Athletic Training. We are excited to be back after a break over this summer. The goal of this podcast is to interview researchers and clinicians on current topics facing athletic trainers and discuss how we can utilize best practices to improve patient outcomes. My name is Lizzie Hibbard, and I will be your host for this podcast. I'm the program director of the athletic training program and an associate professor at the University of Alabama. My research focuses on shoulder and elbow injury prevention in youth overhead athletes. You can follow me on Twitter at E.E. Hibbard. Before starting on the episode, I wanted to acknowledge that I know this is a very challenging time for athletic trainers and the experiences of ATs are wide ranging. We hope that you are all taking care of yourself in whatever way you need. Because of continuing COVID restrictions, many of us are still recording from our homes. If there is any change in the quality of the audio, it is due to this. And once we're able to return to work, the audio quality will be back to normal. Like everyone else, we are doing the best we can with the situation at hand. I also wanted to remind you all that content from JAT is open access, meaning it is free of charge to all readers thanks to funding from the National Athletic Trainers Association. The goal of this podcast is to focus on current issues facing athletic trainers, and the most pressing issue in the world right now revolves around COVID. This episode is a bit unique for this podcast in that we're we're interviewing a research team who's in the process of collecting and analyzing data, where they interviewed ATs on their challenges, opportunities, and experiences related to returning to athletics and COVID. So this project is not published in the Journal of Athletic Training yet, and the results are still preliminary, but the research team felt like they had a lot of information to share that could be valuable to others. So we are fortunate to have all five members of the research team on the podcast with us today. Because of this, we are not going to do long introductions, so we'll just do brief introductions, and their social media is linked in the show notes, so you can follow them or learn more about them. So joining us today is Tom... Tom Abdenauer, um, who is the head athletic trainer at San Diego State, Justin DeSanti, a postdoctoral researcher at AT Still University, Christy Eason, the vice president of sports safety at the Corey Stringer Institute at the University of Connecticut, Eric Post, who is a repeat guest, um, who is the assistant professor and program director of the professional master's program at Indiana State University, and Haley Root, an assistant professor at Northern Arizona University. So we are excited for them to join us all today. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the podcast by asking sort of a general question, because this will be um, new to everyone, because it's not like everyone's read the article and we're just following up. So if you guys can tell us a little bit about the project, um, where the idea came from, and sort of the unique qualifications of your research team that make you all an effective research team. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take that one, Lizzie, since um, I'm not really the qualitative expert, and then I'll pass it on to the experts on the panel to talk about the results. But, you know, I had been working with um, Justin and Christy and Haley on a separate project related to sports specialization and doing some qualitative interviews. And so they were providing their qualitative expertise in that area. Uh, we decided to put that project on pause due to everything being shut down with COVID-19. And then uh, Tom Abdenauer, who's uh, our resident uh, Hall of Famer, he's always providing me with, uh, since he's in that San Diego area, he's always providing me with research ideas and, you know, shooting off ideas. He fought, he sent me an email wondering if, you know, we'd seen so much in the news talking to uh, athletes and talking to professional leagues and administrators and coaches about how the return to sports is going to go. But nobody was really talking to, you know, the members of the healthcare team, the athletic trainers. Uh, and so he had the idea of, you know, why don't we try to interview some head athletic trainers at NCAA institutions uh, to try to get a sense for, you know, exactly what they're going through during this unprecedented time and really to interview them in a qualitative way to kind of just you know, get a snapshot of this moment in time to see, you know, everything that was going on. So he sent me that idea. I'd already been working with, you know, we'd been working as a, as a group on another qualitative project. So I sent that out to everybody. And I mean, we were moved really fast on this. I was really, you know, it's one of those collaborative projects that came together uh, in a really amazing way. Tom sent me the email I looked on May 12th and we did our first interview. We had done IRB approval, um, piloted the, come up with the, quest, the interview guide, piloted the interview guide, and we did our first 
interview a month later on June 12th. So we knew it was time sensitive and, you know, everybody's really come together to um, pull this off in a, in a really kind of quick way. We interviewed 24 uh, head athletic trainers across uh, a number of different NCAA institutions. All right. Well, uh, thanks for that overview of the, of the project and kind of uh, what your goals were. I'm impressed um, not only with the speed of the research team, but also of your IRB at your university. Um, so uh, I'm very impressed that people were, were willing to work quickly on this, both, you know, on, at all levels, because um, of, like you said, it is time sensitive. So um, can you guys tell us a little bit how you identif- about how you identified the athletic trainers that you were going to be interviewing? We set it up. As Eric pointed out, we wanted to interview a variety of athletic trainers across the country. And uh, what we we needed was um, representation in a diverse employment settings. And um, so we we ended up with seven head athletic trainers at the Division I FCS level. And those are the schools that you're familiar with playing football on Saturday afternoon on national television. And we had four, I believe, at the football championship level, the, what used to be, um, so the first one was the football bowl series. Second one was the, what used to be the one double a. And then also we interviewed people from the division of the NCAA that does not play football. So we had of the 24 member institutions that we interviewed. We had, um, 14 from division one, six from division two and four from division three. And, uh, we started out basically reaching out to colleagues that I knew and that we all knew. And um, then from there, we branched out into areas that uh, we tried to get a little bit more of a depth. Um, For example, we reached into the HBCUs, and uh, we found one colleague there. Um, And uh, uh, a lot of it was just personal connections, and it worked out real well. In fact, there was one colleague that we were talking to that was telling us, hey, you guys need to talk to this particular colleague at this particular institution. So we reached out to him and uh, he jumped on it very quickly and we, we had some great conversations with him. We would have liked to have had a few more, except during the summer, particularly this summer, we don't know how many people were not checking emails to get back to us. But all in all, we're very happy with the fact that we had two dozen head athletic trainers representing all 10 districts and uh, it worked out quite well. So this is a very broad question and probably a big question, but in interviewing all of these athletic trainers, what are some of the common themes that you guys identified of concerns for returning to athletics um, and returning back to their workplace? Yeah, so to kind of give a little bit of context here as well, uh, Eric mentioned how sort of rapid the time frame was for us to kind of get this study rolling and data collection uh, occurring as well. And, and even so, it was really fascinating that, you know, as we would have meetings from earlier in the week to later in the week that things would be uh, constantly evolving uh, as well as information came in. And so what we have here are preliminary results uh, and some commonalities as well, but uh, it should be mentioned as well that, that we're you know still analyzing this and working through some of the nuance as well. But uh, so three of the key things we pulled out here, first were just this idea of uh, the efforts to try to stay up to date on this constantly evolving situation was really difficult. And I think that most of us can relate to that, that we've been a little bit maybe overloaded or at least inundated with information. And, uh, you know, the athletic trainers mentioned that whenever they would put a plan in place, suddenly they would get this new information, whether that would be uh, changing case rates at a local or, or national level, um, different regulations, best practice recommendations. Uh, and then they would be constantly having to reevaluate and adjust their plans so that uh, it kind of never felt like they were fully stabilized and kind of having to stay on their toes that way was something that uh, was really challenging as they progressed over time. Uh, the second theme that we had was this lack of explicit precedent in terms of the situation. So I think that unprecedented word has been thrown around quite a bit in different circles, and it really does, I think, uh, ring true here as well, particularly in the idea that we don't have explicit empirical evidence uh, that really kind of backs a lot of the ideas that are going on here, uh, at least to this, in the same sense that some other um, more, I guess, regular type of practices, uh, standard practices might be uh, backed by. So uh, you know, like many things related to this pandemic, there, there's sort of this demand for giving that information and giving those recommendations right now. And uh, as we know that that process isn't always the way things things work and trying to have these you know, evidence-based practice that will be able to transfer and, uh, you know, be sure that they'll work or at least uh, increase the likelihood that they'll work, uh, they, they, they take some time at, at times there. So just trying to 
make, uh, make sense of kind of what to do without this, this backing um, when the stakes are so high or, or it was just a, a challenge that they mentioned kind of across context uh, and over time as well. Uh, and then the last theme pulled out here is a theme we call the other 20 hours. And that's actually phrasing used by a, an athletic trainer that we interviewed. Uh, this idea that if athletes are in facilities and participating for four hours a day, what do they do in the other 20 hours? Uh, so in college, we don't have this ability to create a bubble-like atmosphere as we've seen uh, in hockey or, or in basketball. So without the same uh, degree of resources or, or the ability to create controlled and regulated environments, uh, kind of how, th how are things going to go once these campuses continue to gradually reopen, uh, programs start to, to compete uh, more and more uh, you know, towards no normalcy as well. Uh, so there's this sense of confidence that we found with, with our participants that they were uh, able to going to be able to promote safe and responsible interactions within the confines of their facilities. But then what do they do outside of those other 20 hours uh, to try to stay safe and uh, in areas that are not going to be as well regulated? So uh, we also had some of those incidents that you probably have seen in the popular media of different teams where they either went to parties or even sometimes didn't seem to even do anything necessarily out of the ordinary, but were the, the rates or outbreaks were occurring uh, on different teams. So it was just really interesting to see you know, how they were trying to then regroup and think, okay, how can we make sure that doesn't happen uh, at our institution? Uh, so I think a really valiant efforts to that, that extent, but uh, in the same way, just understanding that there's only so much that they can do um, with those other 20 hours to, to ensure they're safe. So you guys identified a lot of concerns that existed and hopefully, uh, or really by the time you guys were interviewing people, they were probably already starting to think about what their plans were for the fall and how you take these concerns and create an environment or create the safest environment that you can. Um, so can you guys talk about some of the common solutions or workarounds or, or um, opportunities that the athletic trainers identified um, relative to these concerns? Yeah, so to pick up where I left off with that other 20 hours idea, uh, one of the, the ideas that was really common amongst the, uh, the participants in, in uh, kind of the overarching effectiveness of these reopenings is having a culture in place and creating that culture uh, to, to really have a shared sense of responsibility so that uh, no one wanted to be the weak link. Uh, you know, the idea that if one person would kind of make a bad decision, we've seen how this can spread, uh, that, that can really kind of take down a lot of important efforts, I guess, to uh, to kind of uh, put those safeguards in place if there is a link in the chain there. So trying to make these expectations and protocols transparent, uh, leading by example, so making sure that the coaches were on board and, and kind of walking the walk as well as talking the talk. And then even following through on, on their protocols as well. If, if, you know, there was a player that stepped out of, of line in terms of the protocols, making sure that they then self-isolated or, uh, you know, kind of that everyone was treated the same there, that that's where we seem to be, be having these athletic trainers feel that programs would be differentiated if, if there was that culture versus if that was a little bit of a weak uh, sense of culture there as well. Uh, secondly, I mentioned the evolving situation of just trying to stay up to date on, on recommendations and best practice. So I, one of the really common themes that was, I think, very, uh, very good to hear and, and just uh, kind of encouraging in terms of the ability to, to pull this off is the sense of constant communication between sort of all levels and, and roles involved in these systems. So that interprofessional collaboration was something that was emphasized, uh, whether that was daily meetings or, or multiple times a week, uh, sort of that no stone went unturned in terms of someone who might be able to offer something in terms of information, uh, resources, or assistance uh, was linked in and then kind of uh, communicating between these different roles was something that athletic trainers uh, were really responsible for as well. So kind of having this, this clear sense of transparency, um, plus sense of community, and then again, the shared responsibility was something here um, that we saw occurring through this communication. Uh, and then lastly, I mentioned the lack of precedent. The idea that there's only so much you could do and that there has to be at some point uh, an acceptance of the uncertainty of the situation and the lack of control, that there's uh, a lot that can be done to, to try to take precautions. But in the end, it's important to realize that there has to be some delegation of responsibility to the individual athletes, to the coaches, uh, and that kind of, you know, as things evolve, that if everyone works together in that way, uh, that's some of the best ways to try to overcome some of this uncertainty uh, of the situation. Uh, so from that, trying to just critically evaluate their setting. Okay, so we have these policies in place, but what's working? What what isn't? And then even or resources at, at 
uh, that are available to figure out, you know, kind of as we go from this kind of idealized version to the nitty gritty of what it's like on a day-to-day basis, how can we evaluate what's going on at our school, in our program, uh, to make sure that we have some mounting evidence, uh, whether it's just local um, or, again, kind of shared between institutions, that's something that can be really helpful to, to start to give some peace of mind and uh, continue to work for in a productive fashion. So I think at that point, I'll I'll kind of turn it over to Haley because she has a couple comments here as well as some of the ways to try to keep up to date and and how uh, our participants were were doing that with different recommendations. So to build off of some of the ideas that Justin was discussing with regard to the lack of precedence, and this is an evolving situation, um, there really wasn't any specific overarching resource that um, athletic trainers were discussing. They really just acknowledged the challenge of the breadth and depth and novelty of all the information. And really the clinicians were describing ways in which they were trying to build their capacity on the front end and trying to spread out um, the load of both identifying and then understanding all the possible sources of information that are out there. So um, kind of small to big clinicians are really talking talking about um, first going off of kind of their school-specific guidelines, if any of those existed. But um, a lot of our clinicians discussed the challenge that uh, they're bringing some of the first students back on campus for all of this. So they're really on that that forefront of creating the guidelines and figuring out how people work with each other. Um, And then, you know, the local and state ordinances or, um, you know, epidemiologists at state hospitals, public health departments, Um, NATA, the strength and conditioning organization, since those were working really hand in hand. Um, And then, of course, like the NCAA level, um, a a lot of people talked about kind of an intra-conference network that they were trying to work together with. Um, And then, of course, kind of the WHO and CDC as, as major information sources. And since the time of the interviews, I think the NCAA has released some suggested guidelines and different athletic conferences have made decisions about how they're um, tentatively approaching the fall as a, as a cohort. But um, again, the athletic trainers just really focused on building systems and their network of kind of human resources in order to stay on top of all the information that's coming out. Um, So I think, and I I think that kind of a goal of the interviews initially for us has also been to sort of serve as a needs assessment to figure out what are clinicians looking for as resources and how can we tailor that information so that it's more usable um, for people. So unfortunately during this time, there have been a lot of athletic trainers that have been furloughed or laid off. And probably even since the time of your interviews, this may have increased um, with some of the decisions coming out about what's happening with um, athletics at, at different levels. And so Um, Have you guys talked or did you all talk with athletic trainers uh, that found themselves in this situation or ATs that were supervising um, others that they had to furlough or lay off? And and how are these ATs coping during this time? Fortunately, each of the 24 that we spoke with were still employed with their full-time jobs. Um, Some of them were working from home with an uncertainty as to when they would go back to their office. Others were in their office. In some cases, they had athletes that they were caring for on a day-to-day basis, either rehabs or uh, covering workouts. Um, however, there were a fair number of the colleagues that we spoke with who had lesser tenured members of their staffs, especially at the smaller schools, who had been either furloughed or were in a kind of a Uh, a state of flux with regard to will they come back? When will they come back? The decisions need to be made. And from what I recall, same with uh, graduate assistant types or interns where people had, from what I recall, had positions who were not refilled going into this year. Um, So yeah, we did not speak to anyone specifically or directly who had been furloughed. However, there was the ripple effect that did affect some of our colleagues, again, particularly at the, the Division Three, and maybe to some extent at the Division Two, but not at the Division One level. And I think Christy has another thought on top of that. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, I would add that while all of the athletic trainers that we talked to were currently employed, there is a lot of information from our preliminary results that um, athletic trainers who have been furloughed or laid off can use. 
You know, as students return to schools and sport resumes across the country, public health guidelines and recommendations are constantly changing, which requires modifications um, to the policies in the schools. You know, as healthcare providers, athletic trainers are perfectly suited to help adjust policies to meet best practices and help translate these changing guidelines into actionable actions. You know, athletic trainers across the country are serving as gatekeepers by integrating local, state, and federal guidelines into their institutional policies. You know, and whether you work in the collegiate setting or secondary school setting, where we've seen so many of our colleagues lose their jobs, athletic trainers are helping to protect the health and safety of all students, not just student athletes. And I think that's the message that we need to get across to our employers. So either as part of your interviews that you all have done or your own experiences and what you're seeing in colleagues, what are unique ways that ATs are showing their value during this time? I know Christy kind of highlighted some things related to this, but um, some, do you guys have some specific things um, that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, thanks. And I think that's actually um, a really great follow-up question. Um, our preliminary results are indicating that athletic trainers are an integral part of their institution's plans to resume sport. You know, they're working alongside athletics, but also institutional administrators serving as an essential voice in the plans to reopen their campuses and also resume sport. You know, athletic trainers are working with their local departments of public health, which highlights our abilities to practice interprofessionally, which Justin um, had previously mentioned. You know, our results also indicate that we value the insight of our athletic training colleagues Almost everyone we talk to discuss reaching out to their peers for advice. And I know that's a little bit divergent from you know, the original question, but I think it highlights the importance of our professional networks and the willingness to help each other out. I don't think there was one person that we talked to who didn't express their willingness to help colleagues out. Um, you know, during this really challenging time, athletic trainers are being seen and they're being valued by important stakeholders holder groups. You know, this situation is unprecedented. I know we've said that before, but it is. It's unprecedented. You know, but if there's a silver lining, it does offer athletic trainers an opportunity for advocate for their patients, for themselves, and also for the profession. And finally, if you guys can talk a little bit about what are the next steps in this research, so specifically with this project, and then how the findings that you find from this can lead um, to future either projects or um, products. Yeah, so first, in, in terms of both the research and practical sense, uh, as Chrissy just mentioned, we, we've we seen time and time again in these interviews that there has been this strengthening of relationships and sort of expansion of interprofessional networks that has occurred uh, in some ways out of necessity, but also very enthusiastically between people who have been able to offer insight uh, into the situation. So, so going forward and, and knowing that athletic trainers are these, these sources of knowledge that are looked to and, and kind of service uh, sort of the connective tissue between multi, multiple branches of healthcare, um, what are some ways that we can use this uh, strength in relationship to maybe uh, apply to other public health initiatives and, and kind of practice going forward? Secondly, a lot of our conversations uh, uh, revolved around the idea of trying to put in term specific policies, uh, you know, maybe even in trying to, to take care of athletes in a physical sense so they weren't injured or, or got sick when they came back. But uh, the psychosocial aspect is something that's really important here as well and, and was addressed in, in our interviews, but maybe just even following up on this as things move forward. Uh, you know, we, we know that athlete, athletic trainers have stepped up to the plate to, to kind of uh, take on some of the burden uh, of, of pressure and, and decision making here. But uh, we want to just make sure that we're giving uh, giving back to them in that way to try to see what are some ways that their psychosocial health has been impacted. Um, what are some ways that we can help with that? And then uh, going down to the athletes, coaches and all other stakeholders as well. What are some things that could be done? Um, because I think certainly this has been a trying time, not just for all of us physically, but mentally and socially as well. So as we move forward. Uh, what are some of the impacts that we, we see at these institutions? I'll pass it over to Eric and he'll go over a couple of last thoughts. here. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. I think, you know, um, one of the goals, our goals, you know, in the short term is to kind of disseminate this information as much as we can since it's time sensitive. And that's why, you know, we appreciate this opportunity to be on the podcast because I think, you know, athletic trainers are living this right now at all different levels. Um, 
And so it's really trying to find creative ways to dis- disseminate this information. Uh, I'm not on social media. I'm a bit of a hermit, but the rest of the team has put together some infographics that they put out on social media, um, you know, and we're open to any suggestions on how we can get this information out in front of our colleagues because, you know, we want to show, you know, the integral role that athletic trainers are playing right now. They're, they have a seat at the table, you know, with university administrators and pretty much everybody we talked to, that was the case, that the athletic trainers are involved on their university task force and determining what the plans are going to be here. So that's kind of our short-term goal. I think the big, one of the big unanswered question is, you know, what's going on at the secondary school level. We talked about athletic trainers being furloughed or being laid off. Um, And, you know, we have over a thousand NCAA institutions, but there's, you know, over 20,000 high schools, um, you know, in America. So, you know, what's going on at those institutions, we already know there's huge, um, uh, inequality in terms of access to athletic trainers at the secondary school level. Um, and now you have, you know, um, those inequalities uh, impacting the groups that are, potential groups that are most at risk for COVID-19. Uh, and you also have, you know, now athletic trainers being laid off at the secondary school level. So even less access to quality uh, health care in that setting. And really like we've shown in our, in these, pre- in these interviews, the athletic trainers are a huge resource for uh, and a knowledge base for developing return to sport um, protocol. So, you know, the fact that at the secondary school level, that's not going on, and we're about to have, you know, um, millions of kids returning to sport in the fall uh, is concerning. Well, I just really want to thank you guys for the work that you put in to this project quickly over the summer. I know this was a lot of um, work to interview everyone and analyze the results and for being willing to share it with people. I think that's a, a really important part of the research process. And the fact that you're even willing to do that before it's in publication is really important for actually getting it out to the people to people who can utilize the information. So uh, thank you for the work you've done on this project. And we look forward to seeing the future research that you all are going to be doing and the products that come from this. I hope you all found this podcast informative and that you can utilize the information as you are navigating this unique time. That's it for today's The AT Tapes, and we're looking forward to the next episodes featuring recent publications in the Journal of Athletic Training. Please remember to rate and subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Also, please follow the Journal of Athletic Training on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at JAT underscore NATA on all three platforms. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join us for next month's episode of The AT Tapes. (music) 